Okay. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yep. All right. Well, my name is Musa Kalenga, and I've got the absolute pleasure to join you here today to share a few thoughts around the platformization of finance, obviously something that's become increasingly important in as far as the world as we know it, and all the changes that we've seen that I'm sure have been touched on throughout uh, the course of the conversation today. My focus ultimately is going to be trying to paint the picture of what the future could look like if we start thinking about not only our continent um, in a slightly more modular fashion, but also the value that we can create as the world of finance to be able to meet the needs of the future. And so I think a good starting point is just to take a little bit of a walk through time and uh, have a little bit of a clearer understanding of how technology has evolved in different ages. At the moment, we all throw around the word, the word disruption, which effectively is a fancy term for changing everything as we knew it. Um, and the only reason disruption has become quite topical is that you have to follow how technology has evolved over time. Uh, first and foremost, we had an era where technology was very passive. Passive technology ultimately meant that the will of the human had to be forced into the will of whatever you were doing. Um, a classic example is in the Roman Empire, um, when effectively you were carving out someone's great statue. You took a big block of stone and someone took a chisel and a hammer and physically created a manifestation of that person, which is a very fancy looking ID photo with someone looking and peering to the sky. Um, in that day and age, it was very sophisticated technology, but we now know the reality of it. It was extremely passive because the will of the human had to be forced into the stone to be able to create the outcome. We then evolved to a more generative technology. And generative technology, the best way to explain it is effectively um, when the human being and the technology meet halfway, so to speak. And if you think about when the mouse was invented and all of a sudden you could slide a mouse across a mouse pad and together with the computer, you could design a document in Word, you could create a PowerPoint, um, you could have an Excel spreadsheet. That's generative technology. It's the best of the human and the best of the technology working together to be able to create an outcome. We find ourselves in a very exciting phase of our history where we now have intuitive technology. And intuitive technology ultimately is the result of the availability of an amazing amount of information that intersects with our computing capability to do phenomenal quantum computing. Intuitive technology is the world where solutions are provided before consumers know they have the problem. Some of you will remember probably the first uh, one or two times that you went into your email application, those of you that use Google, and you started to type an email, and Google suggested how you should finish off the sentence. It understood your phrasing. It suggested words you should use. And the first few times it happened, it was probably very weird and quite freaky for most of us, but the reality is that is the world of intuitive technology. All it is, is that Google has read enough of your emails, it's understood your phrasing, it understands your tonality, so that it can now suggest the way you should sign off or suggest the way you should open up an email. It's not, uh, it's not any uh, crazy science, it's simply the application of data in a world where quantum computing um, has become the norm. So intuitive technology opens up an entirely new world for finance. It opens up a huge opportunity for us to start thinking about the problems that we have currently and the problems that we'll have in the future and to start bus building business models and technologies around those problems that solve issues before customers even know they have them. So here's a quick look at how fintech is evolving to start to meet this challenge where it's at. And then we'll delve into a little bit more about what that means in as far as value creators and entrepreneurs in this new world of finance in as far as platformization is concerned. Big techs and challenger banks are attracting consumers through hyper-personalized experiences and innovative products. That's why banks must embrace an open X approach, where X stands for experience, and quickly transform into inventive banks, according to the World Fintech Report 2020 by Capgemini and EFMA. Big techs and challenger banks offer unique strengths and capabilities. Their cloud-native design, open and evolutionary platform infrastructure, and data-driven mindset empowers their last-mile delivery. So it's not surprising that their overall user experience is tempting customers, particularly when 48% of Gen Y and tech-savvy customers say they're frustrated by poor service from their primary banks. To remain competitive, incumbent banks must become agile, customer-centric, and inventive. How? By strengthening their middle and back-end operations through collaboration by design with fintechs. Up until now, most incumbent banks ignored the middle and back end, 
and focused instead on the customer facing last mile experience. But only by modernizing the middle and back end operations will banks succeed in the OpenX ecosystem, which is an open platform where players across industries collaborate to enhance customer experience. This will help banks to retain or even grow their market share. Success in the OpenX ecosystem will best be demonstrated by inventive banks and mature fintechs using a structured approach for effective collaboration focused on people, finance, business, and technology. It's time to move from open innovation that only delivers proof of concept into applied innovation that enables scalable products ready for mass distribution. Big techs and challenger banks may be winning over customers, but for inventive banks, the game is still on. By effectively collaborating with mature fintechs across the whole value chain, from development to the last mile, they will deliver, delight, and win customers' hearts, minds, and wallets. And it's a very important reflection for us to think about this notion around OpenX because the world that we live in ultimately is a connected world. It's a world where um, you don't need to be the best at everything. You simply have to have an obsession and a fixation with a particular problem. And in so doing, you can actually integrate a lot of the solutions around that. And so for us to consider the impact that has for Africa as a continent, I thought we'd play a quick game. Because as financial services shifts into this OpenX environment, and we think about platformization as potentially the way of the future, it's really important for us to consider some of the core tenets of platformized businesses and what they've done really well. So may I suggest that we play a quick game, right? Uh, I'm going to show you a company, um, or I'm going to show you a scenario, and you're going to tell me what company that is. And through that, we'll be able to see a pattern and be able to understand how platform businesses have delivered on value on both sides of the demand curves. So if I was to say to you, in the home movie market, where studios are matched to audiences through technology, what immediately comes to mind? Of course, Netflix. And Netflix has been able to find a way to be able to link studios and audiences by buying movie rights and distributing them as bundles via subscriptions to audiences that are interested in buying um, an unlimited array of, tech, of, uh, of entertainment options. Here's the next one. Um, what's the market for car rides that links passengers and drivers? Well, that's an easy one. Uber. And Uber has been able to do that by being able to reduce the fleet downtime and being able to link the drivers to passengers and do that through an app and be able to create value on both sides of the demand and the supply curve. If I was to say to you, what creates a market for touristic housing using a platform exercise? Well, also, Fairly obvious, Airbnb. Airbnb has got hosts, it's got tourists, and it creates an environment where tourists are able to book um, their related experience through a site and hosts can fill um, their vacant capacity. And through that, they reduce risk. And they provide a way where people can manage a quality experience and ensure a particular standard of delivery. And the interesting thing is when you look at all of these, they're platform businesses. And platform businesses at their core link asset holders, to clients and on both sides you have what they call frictions you have problems on the asset holder side you may have things like outreach challenges um high asset downtime uh, like we have with uber you may have gatekeepers that are unnecessary and you have, may have all these challenges that asset holders will have and they typically drive supply and on the demand side you have clients or customers and they may have challenges of access they may have um, challenges of quality of service they may have trust issues whole bunch of different problems but on both supply and demand side, there are very clear frictions. And what we need to think about in the financial services sector is what are the asset holders and what are the client bases that we try and serve and identify those frictions. Because through those frictions, you can start to serve both sides of the market. And when you serve both sides of the market, you give value to asset holders and clients. And that's how you build a multi-sided platform. And so as organizations like um, Uber and organizations like um, Airbnb have understood and started to perfect, They've started to be able to create huge amounts of value by being able to solve for these frictions in quite a simple way. The interesting thing is when you look at all of these companies in their early stages, the greatest challenge that they face is effectively being able to create um, the balancing act between the interests of the different sides, both demand and supply. Very similarly in financial services, we've got a challenge that we have to get the balance right between, as an example, the unbanked and financial services providers. And that balancing act, that dance is really where the value is. And if you get that right, it's what they call the point of ignition. 
And as you grow the business and as you develop the value, that's where you get the cross-network externality, which effectively means that the more users you increase on one side, it creates more value for the other side. And so if you think about the world that we're going into, which is all about shared value um, and about being able to create more transparency and honesty, for financial services, this is actually a really core challenge. But if we solve those frictions, we can create a phenomenal amount of value. If we also just quickly reflect on our context in Africa, because platformization doesn't kind of operate as a um, ethereal concept, we have to consider where we are. And in Africa, one of the key challenges, if we look at the Human Development Index, is number one, we've been registering the lowest since 1990. And while there's an incremental uh, improvement in the human development condition in Africa, we're still not getting to the levels where we can compete with the rest of the world. So the black line that you see at the bottom represents the human development condition in Africa, and the ones at the top represent Asia, Latin America, Europe, as well as the Arab states. So it's quite clear that we've got some catching up to do as a continent. And if you look at the progress in terms of getting better, I think it's an incremental um, change that we're starting to see. The second graph which you need to look at and consider is interesting because this looks like that platformization graph. It's the J-curve. It's the acceleration of technology. It's when you went from the printing press in the 1400s to 3D printing where we are now. And this acceleration, this J-curve is really where you get the value, an exponential value over time. And as we think about financial services and platformization, there'll be some fintechs that will see a curve of this nature. But the real question we need to ask ourselves is as we improve technology and as we get it to accelerate the way it does, and we see the human development condition simply incrementally getting better, the provocation is how do we make sure that we close the gap between technology and the human development condition? That means that our solutions have to be far more meaningful. It means that we have to ask ourselves why we can send people to the moon, but we can't feed people on earth. It means that the business models of the future with fintechs and financial services have to start solving for human issues as well as community challenges. If we get that right, it means that we're actually fundamentally improving the lives of the people that we hope to serve, and we're building multi-sided platforms that solve frictions on both ends. And for me, that's really the exciting thing about financial services. The challenging thing means is that we're going to have to make some tough decisions. And the contrarian matrix is a really interesting way to view the decisions that we're going to make as businesses. First and all, you're going to make decisions that are either right or wrong, right? As a business um, and as a company, you're going to make a decision that will either be right or it'll be contextually wrong. You're also going to have the challenge of either making a decision that will go with the consensus, what everybody's doing, or be a contrarian decision, go against the grain. And in so doing, you have to start thinking about how those decisions have got either an incremental impact in the future or that have got a capped value that you can get in terms of upside. So if you make the wrong decision and you are going against the grain, that's probably the worst place you can be. You're the guy who's going against the grain saying everybody else is wrong. And ultimately, in the long term, you are, your decision was incorrect. You can make the wrong decision and you can make the same decision that everybody's making. And that's actually OK, because we all if we're all not getting it right, that's better than one of us getting it wrong. And then when you look on the right hand side, that gets really interesting. You could make the right decision and you could make the decision everybody's making, digitization. Um, that's the right decision, but everybody's doing that. Why? Because it's just what needs to happen. Now, the upside that you'll get by digitizing is really not exponential because if everybody's doing it and they've made the correct decision, then really you're not going to get much value. The place that becomes really interesting is when you make the right decision based on a direction you're going, and it's the decision that not many people have made. That's where organizations tend to get a lot of value. For financial services, I think this contrarian view of what value creation is going to be in the future is going to be the difference between those that make it and those that don't. Now, the reality is that we've got a lot of challenges we need to solve for, but this is a really great place to start thinking about the problem. I believe that if we approach uh, the financial services sector in that way, Africa has got a real opportunity to leapfrog the rest of the world. I think it's an exciting point of view, and I really believe that it's a challenge for us especially when we're thinking about the future and how we'll be able to develop value to claw back from the huge, huge amount of damage that COVID-19 has done to our economies. Um, but with that, I wish you the best, and I hope that you've taken some value in being able to understand how platformization uh, can change our continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Musa, for that uh, brilliant presentation. And it's actually quite interesting to think about some of the stuff that you've brought up. And what I love about this uh, particular summit is that we started off on a high note and we're also ending off on a high note as well. So thank you so much for sharing those particular insights with us. And for those of you who have been engaging, I did notice that you got a few thumbs up moving on the screen as you were doing a presentation. So um 
clearly some of the delegates were really loving what you had to say. So thank you once again. There doesn't seem to be any questions in the Q&A box, but I'm sure... Um, as people follow you in social media, uh, if you are active on social media, they'll probably engage and um, talk with you a little bit further. Just a reminder, all the presentations that you heard today will be available, including the media. So if you want to go back and you want to refresh some of the thoughts or points that came through and you want to share it with your team back at the office, you will be more than welcome to. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, we had a lot to discuss. Like We were started off looking at uh, you know, fi- disruption in financial services as uh, the emergence of a super platform came through. We had the guys from NetBank talking to us about their experience with uh, Aval. We also had a fantastic panel discussion looking at Investing in the right digital transformation solutions, looking at data analytics in the personalization uh, of services, as well as uh, becoming an innovation first organization. We looked at the modernization of uh, legacy systems in financial services. We asked the question, is there an insurance gap in um, on the continent that we need to close and can microfinance do that for us? And of course, all these conversations would not have been possible without our sponsors. Um, Mambo, uh, BCX, Casisto, Ozone, Caseware Africa, and Nuvo. Thank you so much for uh, participating with us and uh, helping us to have these kinds of conversations. And we do hope that you will be back with us as we, again, take strategies beyond COVID and we look to the future and try and figure out um, what the future holds uh, for us. And hopefully we'll also have some um, uh, viable products and we'll have some case studies in terms of some of the stuff that we have discussed today. Thank you so much for joining me and for joining many of our panelists and discussion uh, discussions rather. Until next time, and I hope to see you soon. Have a fantastic day, and it's a goodbye for me.